From the high halls of Asgard, we're happy to bring you two new pins. Thor the Thunderer and the Allfather Odin are available for limited time at our crowdmade shop, and Thor's lightning glows in the dark. Link below. Scandinavian design is a home decor trend from the 1900s characterized by simplicity, function, and elegant minimalism. It's the reason everything at Ikea looks like that, and why it's spelled like that. But it is hardly the only design aesthetic native to the far northern edge of Europe. Look through cities like Stockholm or Copenhagen, and you may be struck by the swirly Renaissance whimsy of all the bronze-coated spires and delightfully bubbly roof lines. Yet part of the charm in Scandinavian style is how all these disparate elements are able to fit comfortably next to hypermodern performance venues and abundant green spaces. All that variety becomes a strength and harmonizes together in all these cities. Both times I visited Copenhagen, I found myself surprised at how much I liked the look of something I, on paper, would not have cared for. I mean, barely any marble, only two domes, yet still I'm a fan. That's not to say they're all winners, but simply that the Scandinavians are good at this stuff, and I shouldn't be surprised by the times when I'm surprised, you know? Among the Scandinavian countries, this leaves Iceland as the odd one out. It is absolutely renowned for its beauty, but specifically and almost exclusively its natural beauty. Granted, that's for good reason. Volcanoes sprung out from the ground tens of thousands of years ago, yet still to this day are constantly erupting, while glaciers carved out huge masses of lands to leave behind winding riverbeds and dramatic glacial waterfalls, creating an otherworldly landscape of mountains, valleys, water, lava, and oh yeah, sometimes the sky glows. So the practical answer for why Iceland didn't put as many skill points into architecture as the others is that Iceland had always been sparsely populated and only really started urbanizing the 1800s, which just doesn't leave a lot of time for that kind of stylistic development. But the aesthetically thematic answer is that Iceland didn't need to bother when the sheer spectacle of the land itself puts the rest of the world to shame. So when the OSP crew and friends took a big group vacation up north earlier this year, we were astounded again and again by the simple fact that Iceland is just gorgeous. And I failed to learn my lesson about being surprised at my own surprise, because while there are only a handful of major architectural landmarks in the city of Reykjavik, this church right here is an all-time classic. To see how, Let's do some history. The beginning of settlement in Iceland takes us back all the way to the late 800s AD, when Scandinavian seafarers happened upon this gigantic island in the middle of the Atlantic. Whether they intentionally set out 700 miles northwest of the mainland, or just stumbled into it accidentally as they overshot the Faroe Islands is anyone's guess. But others soon joined them, and by 930 they had enough settlers to formalize a commonwealth on the island with the medieval world's first representative assembly, the Althing. Yet they couldn't escape those darn nasty kings back in Scandinavia for long, as Norway's king sent Christian missionaries to Iceland at the end of the century, and then after two entire centuries of meddling, it got glomped into the Kingdom of Norway in the 1260s. In the 1300s, it variously united under Sweden, and then under Denmark, and then finally they achieved peak Scandinavia by snowballing together into the Kalmar Union. This lasted up to 1523 when Sweden left, but the politics of mainland Europe had limited impact out in Iceland. What did make a splash was the Protestant Reformation, when newly Lutheran Danes forcibly converted Iceland out of Catholicism and closed all the monasteries. And this was not the only thing Denmark forcibly did, as they later imposed a strict trading monopoly on Iceland with the specific purpose of siphoning out all of Iceland's wealth and then hideously upcharging them for basic goods in return. Denmark got Iceland's best on the cheap, which they could then turn around and sell for huge profits, while Iceland had to pay name-brand prices for Denmark's bottom-shelf products. Not exactly fair, but that's empires for you. The joy of being a distant corner of someone else's kingdom continued through 1786, when the monopoly was partially abolished, so all Danes, but still only Danes, could trade with Iceland. This coincided with the founding of a port city at Reykjavik at the supposed site of Iceland's first settlement by the Vikings. Iceland's ancient assembly, the Althing, was briefly suspended but restored in 1844, now in Reykjavik, which granted it a status as the economic and political capital. Iceland got its own flag in 1915, with its colors representing the mountains, glaciers, and volcanoes that characterized the land. In 1918, they were granted sovereignty but remained part of the Danish crown because monarchy is weird like that. In the Second World War, Denmark was occupied by the Nazis, so Iceland figured now was as good a time as ever to bail and declared independence as a republic in 1944, one millennium and change after the original founding of the Althing. So despite the abundantly long history of Iceland overall, its modern shape is remarkably new, and that of course includes the architecture. The typical Lutheran churches were plain, made of wood, usually with one allotted accent color, all in keeping with the Protestant taste for simple and unfussy churches. But with Iceland's new sovereignty in the 1900s, there was an appetite for a showcase of distinctly Icelandic architecture, and state architect Gudjon Samuelsson was more than up to the task. He worked on Reykjavik's urban planning and designed buildings around Iceland, including the Herathskolin schoolhouse, 
in the style of traditional turf houses, and the inventively Art Deco-ish Akureyrarkirke, as well as the main University of Iceland building and the National Theatre, which both reflect the starkness of Iceland's natural landscape while incorporating various modernist elements. It's nothing too out there, but it all helped to develop a style of Iceland for Iceland. Then, in 1937, the state commissioned what would become his centerpiece project for Reykjavik, a Lutheran church in honor of the Icelandic clergyman and poet Halkrimur Petersen. His Passiusalmar, or Passion Hymns, had been a central fixture in Icelandic faith and literature since their composition in the 1600s, making him arguably the most prominent Icelandic poet this side of the Eddas. And in his honor, Halkrimskirkja would become the grandest church in all of Iceland. So how did the talented Mr. Samuelson pull it off? Essentially, he looked to Iceland itself for inspiration, much as he had done in his previous work. And here, that meant designing the church to echo the volcanic basalt columns that appear across the country because of Iceland's bonkers geothermal properties. The basalt is almost perfectly hexagonal, despite occurring naturally, and it makes for a fantastic design motif on the church. The entire exterior here is made of a very rough white concrete to mimic the ruggedness of uncut stone, and the wings and tower are shaped to look just like the basalt columns. The effect is striking, and Holkramskirke seems like a mountain standing right in the center of the city. The back of the church follows a more traditional basilica structure with some gothic detailing in the windows, but it continues that geometric texture and crisp aesthetic which make it so distinct. And, as is right and just, there is a dome. Yet even Holkramskirke does not exist apart from nature, and the ever-temperamental Icelandic weather makes the surface of the church into a canvas for light. It's imposing in the fog and snow, shines bright white on a clear day, and takes on a golden glow in the sunset. And it might be in this particular lighting that you realize where Marvel's Asgard got its inspiration. It's extra charming if you look at the church from Reykjavik's Rainbow Road, which was added as a lovely display of LGBT pride, but also doubles as a cute reference to Bifrost, the rainbow bridge that leads to Asgard. Now stepping through the big bronze doors and into the church itself, it is a thoroughly Lutheran space, lacking in frills and described by my esteemed colleague Red as not finished rendering yet. And while that acerbic assessment may be accurate, the space is no less impressive for it. If anything, the pure simplicity lets the interior be come as a dedicated spectacle of light. Much like the outside, the space is stark, but that minimalism connects you to that pure sense of Iceland. To me, it felt like stepping into a mountain or a glacier, the main difference being that most mountains don't have a 25-ton, 5,000-pipe organ in the back. It's incredible for concerts, and also lets the church serve as a place of community as well as worship. Down at human level, there's also plenty to appreciate, from the quintessentially Scandinavian seating, which impressively incorporates the basalt motif, to the small selection of religious art, work around the church, to the crystal baptismal font that refracts rainbows when it catches the light. Many churches manage to feel like empty rooms, but Hockenumskirche, which objectively has a lot less stuff in it, feels complete and rich because the light perfectly fills what the church leaves open. It's in constant interaction with the natural landscape, echoing what it can while acting as a mirror for the rest. Having been commissioned seven years after the millennial anniversary of the All Thing and finished on Reykjavik's bicentennial, Hockenumskirche is true to Samuelson's intent. Every inch of the place celebrates what makes Iceland, Iceland. And damn, it is pretty. Thank you so much for watching. Myself, Red, Cyan, Indigo, the Greens, and all of our friends who went to Iceland had an absolutely fantastic time, and as soon as I looked at that big old church again, I knew I needed to make a video on it. I'd like to thank all the people of Iceland who were so kind and hospitable to us, as well as Midgard Adventure, which is the excellent tour company we booked with. If you find yourself compelled to visit Iceland, and I hope you do, we highly recommend them.